I'm the program coordinator with West Virginia University Extension Small Farm Center. And I wanna welcome you to the six week webinar series that is designed to increase your marketing knowledge of affordable and effective strategies that vendors can use at farmers markets to increase their sales. Um, as we've mentioned before, there are many grants associated with this particular mini series through our partners at the West Virginia Farmers Market Association. So definitely keep track of your emails and updates from them. Uh, as part of your participation in the virtual trainings, we're also asking you to track sales data if you are receiving one of those mini grants. So those are all important things to just kind of remind you as we move forward. And of course, I do want to recognize the fact that this mini series is provided as a grant program and give a big thank you to our funders that are making the trainings and the mini grants possible. That's a big thing for us. So I want to make sure I thank our partners at the West Virginia Farmers Market Association, who's really helping reduce the paperwork burden for us by giving out those mini grants and also saying thank you to the Northeast Risk Management Education Center and uh, USDA NEFA, who helped really sponsor all of this. So as participants, really the goal over the six weeks is to learn about creating a marketing plan, which we talked about last week, and I encourage you to definitely do that. You can definitely reach out if you have additional questions about getting started there. Uh, telling your particular farm story, which we've talked about through social media, how to enhance displays, which are really talking about today. Uh, next week, we're going to talk more about the psychology of sales, and then we're going to wrap everything up by talking about the relationship building that you can do as a vendor, and then also encourage your farmer's market to do as well. So as we go through the series, if you have any questions or concerns, please reach out. We're always available. You can reach out to myself, Lisa Jones, or any of the uh, presenters have also been very open about answering questions. So we, I don't actually think we have a poll today. That's, do we have a poll, Emily? I don't think we have a poll. So not this week, we have a poll. Next week, we'll definitely have a poll again. Um, so without further delay, I'm just going to pass the screen on to our main presenter and we can get started. Thanks, Lisa. Hang on, I got to There we go. All right. Everybody see the right screen? Or the wrong it is, screen? It is it is your notes screen. It is the wrong screen. How about now? Perfect. Okay, <laughs> good. All right. So uh, happy lunchtime, everybody. My name is Emily Morrow. I am an agriculture and natural resources agent for WU Extension. I am based in Jefferson County. Today, we're going to be talking about marketing for profits. So a large thing we're going to be talking about is your displays, your strategies, and those things that can help you boost your sales when you're actually going to the market. Whether you're going to a real in-person market, maybe you have an on-farm market, maybe you are sending your products to a different market for somebody else to sell, all of these strategies will help. So we all know that a good display can help increase sales. It helps draw customers into you. It helps them pay attention. It um, gravitates people to you because you have a nice colorful display. Maybe things are nice and neat. You have a, a wide variety of products. There's lots of different factors there. Um, so we're going to start by giving just a few different tips and tricks on how to uh, draw those people into your booth. So you would want to keep your booth full but you don't want to keep it cluttered. I understand that's easier said than done. Um, I have two little kids, so that's how I feel like my house is all the time. It's full and cluttered, despite my best efforts. Uh, your display should be a work of art and think of it as a work of art that's available to purchase too. So all of those things, the way you place them, the way that they are looking should um, help you increase those sales and draw those people into your booth. 
it might seem like a no brainer, but your produce and your products and things on your table should be clean, should be neat and organized, not leaving your personal water bottle sitting up there. Um, you know, the, your can of Coke that you're working on as a mid morning pick me up, um, keeping it kind of clean of things that might be on your personal side, whether that's you or your employees. Um, a good strategy is putting your products up putting them on a table or a shelf. Um, that shelf doesn't have to be like super high. And I'll show some examples of that later. Uh, psychology of sales actually show that people, um, in particular women, don't really want to bend down to get their products. So by putting it closer up to eye level, um, you can do some layering with your booths as well to get them up uh, a little bit more to eye level. But just uh, not putting them on the ground uh, gives people a perception that maybe that product is dirty if it's touching the ground, even though maybe the part that's touching the ground isn't something you'd eat, like a potted plant or something. It just helps people get into that mindset that you have a quality product. A tablecloth, it goes a really, really long way. It helps um, those tables look nice and neat and organized. Um, if any of you have gone to craft shows or anything things like that, you you know the types of displays we're, we're talking about. And those techniques can be mirrored when it comes to produce. You always want to put your produce in a basket, a bin, a container, something that's nice and clean. You don't have to use something really, really fancy or expensive. The Dollar Tree has a great selection of large containers. Um, if you guys are in an area that has like a Gabe's near you, we have, um, I know they're, they're based out of Morgantown and there's some spread across the city of West Virginia. I'm able to find like really cheap containers there for like just a couple bucks a piece that are a lot larger that would be able to hold things like the acorn squash, the spaghetti squash, um, just to give it a nice like clustered appearance. You want to keep your containers as full as possible. Uh, if things are starting to settle, sell down and you don't have that produce and you're uh, getting towards the end of the market, um, putting into a smaller container, maybe that's when you get rid of the container and just put those last little pieces of that acorn squash um, or that butternut squash on, on the table itself or clustered in a way. Um, if you have larger containers than you have product that week, using some filler too, it could be fabric, could be straw, um, could be styrofoam if you're not using like a clear container where people would see it to help give it the illusion of the bin being full and overflowing. Um, and you want to keep your product free of debris. This also might seem like a no-brainer. You don't want to have any lingering dirt on your potatoes. Um, we all know potatoes come from the ground. Most of us are washing them before we're eating it. But you want to invite people to come uh, touch your product, uh, to come and purchase it and take it out of the bins and then ultimately end, home, end up home with it. When it comes to setting up your booth too, too much information is better than not enough information. You want to give people really clearly defined prices. You want to give them all the information possible with your product. If you are purchasing product that maybe didn't come from that area, and I know I have some farmers in my area that per, uh, that run like farm stands or farmers mark or go to farmers markets, and maybe they purchase their sweet corn from the eastern shore of Maryland because they want to be the first person that has sweet corn. Well, and I'm talking about one producer I work with in particular, when she posts her sweet corn up on her social media, she tells people, I got this from the Eastern Shore. She's not, um, I, she contracts with the farmer to grow it for her and that's who, that's who she gets it. Uh, she's not, you know, sugarcoating that. She's saying this isn't grown in my backyard, uh, but it is somewhat a little bit local. Um, so she's the first one that has sweet corn. Uh, how it was grown. If you follow any unique production practices that people like, people like to hear that. People like to have that connection with the farmer themselves. If you're producing something that might be a little not typical, giving information on how to cook it or how to use it. Just like this picture from uh Morgantown Farmers Market posted a photo of uh, hot pepper jelly that one of their vendors was selling at their farmers market. They have the name, they have the price, and then they tell you what it tastes like and how you might want to eat it. I don't know how to eat hot pepper, pepper jelly. I'll eat it all day long. But for people that maybe haven't purchased that product before, that helps them make the jump into purchasing it. I should mention, um, if I have a photo that comes from an outside source. I've credited that source. Um, if there's not a credit on it, it's a photo that's I've taken um, probably here locally in the Eastern Panhandle. 
Also giving some information on how to store it too. Things like um, winter squash can be stored at, for a longer period of time. Um, some people don't put their tomatoes in the fridge. They keep a little better if you don't. Uh, if the eggs can be unrefrigerated too, those types of, of, of details too is really important to people too. They appreciate that information and it might and implore them to come back to you and keep buying from you. So let's talk a little bit about the psychology behind signage. There's actually a study done by Cornell that says people are willing to buy more if you don't use the dollar sign on your signage. And I read about this and then um, in all the photos I found everybody's using the dollar sign. So I don't know if anybody can really attest to that being a, a tried and true practice. Um, we've all probably heard the strategy that using the number nine rather than a zero and ending your price um, works well. It kind of tricks people into thinking, oh, I'm not spending $3, I'm spending $2.99. I understand that is way easier said than done and often not practical when it comes to selling from a farmer's market because he wants to carry all of these pennies around to be able to give that change back to people paying in cash. So I personally don't know that that is something that I would recommend for a farmer's market booth unless you find that a lot of your sales are done by credit card and that's not something that people are really going to be picked up on. But there is some studies that suggest that that does kind of trick people into to making the purchase. That's why you used to see all those infomercials in the early 2000s that said two easy payments of $19.99 and you got whatever cheesy product they were selling at the time. If you go in the store now, we still see it a lot. Things are prices at $1.99 um, for, you know, a nice loaf of bread or something like that. $3.98 for things at the Walmart. You can also color coordinate your display. It helps draw the eye to your display. It helps draw people into your display as well. This can include things like your signage, your tablecloth, your containers that you use to put your produce in, if they all have the same, they don't necessarily have the same color. And I think um, there might be a presentation later that talks a little bit more about, about color and people's perceptions when it comes to, to looking at different colors. But they might have a same theme. A lot of people like that nice rustic farmhouse theme. I see a lot of my producers adopt it too. They use wooden crates to store their products or elevate their products. They use like neutral colored tablecloths. Maybe like sometimes they might use, you know, that red and white checkered gingham print that people really associate with like a farmhouse theme. Uh, one producer that uses a nice dark blue with a nice rustic um, pair with that nice rustic uh, brown crate um, and whites and blacks and stuff and her displays always look very very nice. Um, if you can use buzzwords um, that are associated with your with your production practices that people see as common marketing ter terms if they apply to your farm. If you're great organic USDA certified you're organic maybe you practice natural practices, maybe you are pesticide free, maybe your meat is antibiotic free, those types of things help build a relationship with your customer because they are now identifying that you and them share the same values. They like that a lot. Importantly, you want to follow all the rules and regulations. We could spend several sessions just talking about this, so I'm just going to touch on it, um, touch on it briefly. Because once you get to the farmers markets, now is not going to be the time to get busted by the health department. Importantly, keeping cold items cold. In selling products, we call these potentially hazardous and non-potentially hazardous. Potentially hazardous meaning things that can cause illness if they're not controlled by time or temperature meats, custard, dairy, washed eggs, those types of things. Um, so you won't find a lot of people in the market keep meats out on the table. You will find they maybe keep a dozen eggs out on their table um, as a display of what their eggs look like so people can see the product. If you are producing anything under the cottage food laws, you want to check what's required there. If you need a permit for that type of uh, product, if it's something like a cheesecake or a custard that is considered a potentially hazardous product that needs to be refrigerate, refrigerated, if that product has label requirements such as allergens um, or the ingredients, and other state laws associated with it as well. The Farmer's Market Vendor Guide, I'll give a shout out to that, is it has a wonderful, wonderful chart that shows exactly, depending on what product you're growing, what 
types of things that you need and where you might get them from. Um, so like I said, we're just going to touch on that just, just briefly. Um, one thing I like to mention with this one is that uh, we can, you know, uh, sell so many eggs under um, a small producer exemption in West Virginia. So a proper label with that shows that these eggs are ungraded, that if they've been washed, they, you know, they need to keep refrigerated, and then they should have the producer's name and address on it as well. This uh, farm in my area sells some baked goods in their on-farm stand, so that's an example of their cornbread. Um, the ingredients are on it, as well as the farm's logo, the farm's name, um, and then this little disclaimer at the bottom probably indicates, I can't read it, but I'm sure it says that this is produced in a home kitchen under um, the cottage foods law and not in a commercial kitchen. So staying on that same thing, theme, you'd want to ask yourself things like, do you need a farmer's market vendor permit for certain products? Do you need additional trainings like a label review or process authority for certain condiments? Do you fall under cottage food laws? Do you have all the requirements associated with that on the label? And this is a big one we run into in my area, being so close to different, um, many, many different states, Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, all within a short drive. Are you selling across state lines? Are you allowed to? Things like baked goods produced in a home kitchen are not allowed to be sold across state lines. And I've had to explain that to some producers as well. Poultry being processed under the um, West Virginia exemption, not allowed to be cross, sell, sold across state lines. Um, so those are important things to note as well. I think Lisa linked that vendor guide in the chat there. It's really helpful too. I reference it frequently. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the art of the display, your farmer's market display. The display is going to um, get customers drawn to you. You want it to completely take the guesswork out of your products and your prices. A lot of people are hesitant to ask how much something costs. Um, sometimes people, especially those of us that might be a little bit more introverted, get a little anxiety talking to strangers. So um, you don't want to put on, you know, a... Uh, misconception that you're going to purchase something by opening up a conversation. Maybe you have the customer hasn't committed to making that purchase yet, but your display is going to want to make people want to buy your products too. They know exactly what they're getting. They know exactly how much it costs. And there's lots of different creative ways that you can do this as well. So that's a, a picture from one of our farmer's markets that they have their spinach and little cell packs. They have it all very, very nicely marked as well. Um, just these little reusable labels. Uh, things don't have to be super expensive in order to be effective. So your display should have products well marked. You want to decorate your booth to be visually attractive. That makes people want to stop and take a look. And you as a producer want to make yourself identifiable and approachable. If you're not going to the market and you're sending a child, one of your kids, um, one of your workers, your husband, whatever it is, they also want to be identifiable and approachable. Maybe that's a farm t-shirt they're wearing. I've also seen producers wear an apron that has their farm name on it. Whoever's going to market, they know that apron's going to fit me versus my husband versus one of your kids or one of your farm workers. Um, so it's a little bit easier investment to make. And then you have a place to put cash, um, your phone, that may be if you use the little square thing too. Um, you want you don't want to be sitting out on your uh, in the back of your van uh, scroll on your Facebook during the whole market. You want to be up and mingling around with people, I'd, um, you know, giving people a nice a smile and wave as they walk by, um, avoiding, you know, clustering with your other farmers. People aren't going to feel like you are approachable at that point. You want to, you know, give your attention to your customers. This is a display on one of our on-farm markets here in the county, but I still think it works. You can see um, that they have some layering of different products. Um, they've used some other cool little uh, rustic items to put their bread up. Um, they have some flour in bags. They have some of these different sweets here. And then they have a nice little um, sign that even tells you what you would pair these crackers with. So then you're getting the producer, the customer to make two different purchases as well. And it's a nice little fun, cute little, um, they do a really good job marketing. So I have a few images from, from their market. If you have a variety of products, um, this is an uh, 
solely an herb farm so they don't do they do have some like potted plants down here you can see on the the bottom left side they do some eggs too but for the most part they're selling live herbs that people go buy and some lettuces so they have a wide variety their whole table is completely covered they have a nice nice tablecloth too and another helpful trick is put your farm name above the table sometimes we tend to um, drape our little farm name plaque um, on the front of the table but as customers are walking by they can't see it customers are blocking it and then if i'm walking by i don't know who you are so maybe i'm not going to stop because i'm not going to think oh that's peace in the valley herb farm i remember them i bought from them last week um, so if you put your name there your name above hanging from the tent in this case um, that's what a lot of producers end up doing uh, people are going to be able to see it and they're going to be able to identify the farm and you uh, these little chalkboard markers are great too you can get chalkboard paint for a couple bucks at michael's uh, you can see they just use these little um, you know scrap wood to to get the names and the chalkboard part up where people are going to be able to see it um, they have it well identified on what the price is, and then they have the individual plant markers too. So if you're looking for a rosemary, you know the rosemary costs $3 and it's on that side of the table. Whereas if you're looking for a nice red leaf lettuce, you know you can get a four pack for $4 and it's on that side of the table. So this um, producer does a good job of displaying their products. And they have a lot of products to make a nice full display too, which really, really is helpful. Not all producers have a large variety of products too. So this is an example of another producer. Um, he solely does honey and then he does some additional beeswax products. So he actually uses some old bee boxes to um, have some unique layering across this table. It gets you to kind of look across the entire table because you want to see the wide variety of products he offers. His honey is over on the left side and then his other products are over on the right side. He's able to sell year round though. Um, their last name is Shade. So their bee box actually has their name on it so um he was telling me about this this is pretty cool um he has a sign too that mentions his production practices if you can't read it it says products raised sustainably without sprays um he does a few other things like he raises rabbits and um for meat and a couple other things but honey and the beeswax products are his primary products and this was kind of early in the season I think I took these pictures a couple Aprils ago so we were pretty early in in the farmer's market season and then he um, kind of layers his products around. If you want the honey, you know where to go find it. But if you want to look at the other things, it kind of draws you across the whole table. So I think he does a good job with his displays. I don't know if he did this on purpose, but his tent is also yellow, um, which makes you think of, you know, bees and honey and casts a nice little glow across the whole from the shade across the whole table. So I thought that was kind of funny, too. This brings us to talking about you want to add dimension to your booths. You want to use all every different piece of square footage you can. Um, you can put products at different le levels too. Like this producer, she puts her eggs up, a few uh, dozens of her eggs up on top of these crates. A little risky move. Someone were to bump into that table, but I admire her for it. And then she does a lot of baked goods too. So she... Um, has a little bit more room to put them in those nice crates. She also uses these little chalkboard signs. Um, you can get them where you can write with chalk on them and they're a little easier to erase, erase. But you can also get like chalk markers to add a little bit more color. They look a little bit more put together. They're a little bit harder to erase too, but um, all of these little signs would be nice and reusable. So she has her products um, identified at the price. Uh, she does these little pretzel pretzel bites too and she even offers people a dipping sauce to go with them so that's something she had to she didn't she's not making it because it's condiment she had to purchase it separately but I'm sure people um like that extra little touch so use any types of unique unique containers you have access to um I know a lot of us probably have these crates lying around I know you can get them they don't have that rustic look, look to them you can get them at craft shops um you can find them sometimes on Facebook marketplace sometimes you can go into your garage uh, sometimes you can go into the messiest part of the farm and you steal something then your father-in-law says why did you take the chicken box again and you say I don't know what you're talking about and then you have to go return it but maybe that's just me so I'm going to show you a few different examples of different displays um, this particular producer does um, herbs and spices so she found or made this nice little sign um, that's really artsy she does um, it kind of goes with the theme of her herb seasonings too. her little labels um, everything's very very clearly labeled um, it's easy to grab uh, I think you just mix this with olive oil um, and 
if I recall, because I've bought from her before, she has probably directions on the back on, on how to use the product. This one I thought was really cool way to identify mushrooms from this producer. Um, they put it in a log and then they have these nice little cards that have a picture of the mushroom, what it is. I think it has the price on it and also how to cook it. So then you can identify it by sight. Um, this is a, a really unique way to display this. This is one of our producers too. They do a great job with their chalkboard. They use those little chalk markers things, but um, they they have a nice display. They have um, their the color of their tablecloth matches the color of their tent. They always have fresh flowers on their display too. They have their sign right behind them. Um, and then they do a little bit of layering too. I have some other pictures showing some examples of their marketing techniques. Uh, this uh, flower producer, pre-cuts her bouquets and has them kind of um, lining the front of her table too. People can just grab them and pay for them. They can smell them as they walk by too. And this is one of our organic producers in the county. They do a lot of city markets. So their displays are always very, very top notch. Um, you can see you have a nice variety of color. Um, those little markers in front are their prices. Everything is clearly defined. Everything is full to the mat too. They have the USDA organic logo on their signage because um, they are organic. Um, everything's bunched together. They, they just do a good job of, of creating that rainbow of colors that really draws your eye to their display. Pre-packing, pre-sorting, or pre-weighing products makes it super, super easy to, for buyers too. Um, a lot of buyers might not know how to pick out good peaches. They might not know how many peaches exactly is enough peaches for their family. So they're going to probably be buying a little bit more if they're getting these cell packs, um, just like over here uh, on the left side versus in the center. Um, I might be more likely to just go ahead and pick up something that's already pre-sorted. I already know what the price is. Um, that they, they don't have to then go weigh that product for me and tell me what the price is. It kind of takes the guesswork out of it. Bit. And a lot of producers do this with their bag salad mixes. Um, they have a variety of things in there. You're getting a variety of flavors, a variety of product. And for a set price, you know what it is going into it. And that usually helps people um, do the jump to make the purchase as well. I was talking to some of my producers about some of their marketing strategies. One of my older, um, more experienced producers, they uh, do a lot of herbs. They do a lot of perennials and annuals and greenhouses and stuff. And this picture was taken like in COVID. That's why everybody's wearing their, their masks. Um, she says she puts her herbs in front of her booth and she puts them low to the ground. That's where people see them and that's where people smell them. And that gets people to make a purchase as well. She puts her annuals and her vegetable plants up a little higher. Um, more of towards eye level on a regular uh, table as well um, that people are, are are not coming up and smelling her kale. Uh, she wants them to be able to, to smell, you know, her rosemary and her basil and those types of things. And then she's got a little display that draws people to her social media, tells them what cards she accepts, um, and her prices are all listed right there too. That helps take the guesswork out of absolutely everything. So she puts a few flowers on the ground. Um, she, you can see she's got some stuff kind of behind her over here um, on the right side that, where she would either restock or maybe she's holding this for someone. You might run into the problem where not much might be available. Maybe it's really early in the season. Maybe it's really late in the season. You can fill the space with other diversified products. Um, this producer does some firewood. His wife does some beauty products. They do a lot of meat as well. Um, things that are value added. Some of my producers buy things from other farmers and um, they sell them retail. They maybe they buy them wholesale, sell them retail, or maybe they just have a partnership with those farms um, to be able to sell their products. It's kind of a mutually beneficial relationship. I know this farm in particular, they could use a tablecloth that would look really, that would really, I think, elevate their booth here. Um, they do some lavender from neighbors. They sell some lavender from neighbors. So that, that helps works for them too. And then some of you might be in a position where you don't really have produce or any of those fillers to fill in a table. Maybe you are just a meat producer. You want to make sure your table is appropriately sized. You want to be sitting there at like three big empty tables with nothing but a sign on them because that seems a little strange to people. Um, this 
producer comes up from Cape and Bridge. They just sell meat. Um, I don't know if they still go to Shepherdstown Farmer's Market. Like I said, this was a couple years ago. They have their price list um, on either side that takes up most of their space, their cash box. Um, they have a smaller tent, a smaller table, and you can see their coolers are in the back where they can keep their product frozen too. So they have managed to fill in their space um, and keep it really appropriately sized and keep all of their product frozen too. I wouldn't be buying that bacon if they had it sitting out so I can see it. But if I ask, hey, can I see a pound of your bacon, they might take it out and, and show it to me. Some non-traditional products too can help fill in the space, can help you diversify sales and attract customers. Most of our farmers markets take place over the lunch hour or end right at the lunch hour. So I know I would be really apt to go buy one of these delicious pepperoni rolls and some cookies that my kids would be begging for um, if I'm going to the farmers market right at 11 o'clock and I'm getting hungry. Um, so those are things that can be done under the cottage food law and, and sold in West Virginia. Um, they do some other baked goods too. This is a, a producer that does mostly baked products, um, but they could be a way to fill in um, some of your sales. Uh, one of my producers has done these little microgreen trays for people to kind of grow their own. Um, and they have, they do granola also in the off season and that helps fill in their table until some of their regular seasoned produce comes in. And another one of our producers does bath salts, um, which was really, really interesting too. She has expanded into doing some of these beauty um, products. Um, she offers them for people to buy in small, like single serving purchases. Uh, people might be more willing to buy it if they can just try it first and then come back and order more. Uh, maybe you're buying it for like a, a, a gift or something too. So that's a way that she has explored into diversifying her sales and she uses herbs and flowers and scents, floral scents that she grows herself too. So it gets a little bit of that as well. A colorful display and displaying your assortment of varieties is also going to help people draw people in. Um, this is a large producer in our area. It's actually two producers that kind of team team up together. One of them produces honey and then another one produces like the jams and the jellies. Um, they're veterans. So that is primarily their cause. They, they market that well. They use the West Virginia grown. Um, they have their nice big uh, sign they set up everywhere and they use the same signage every single time so you always know that that's that's who it is uh, one thing I like that they do with their little jams and jellies is um, I, I do like the little fabric over the rings that uh, correspond with different flavors it helps you kind of pick it out it's like oh I know this one's different so let me let me pick it up and look at the different flavor but I love the little spoon that comes with it that is such a great idea um, low cost for the producer um, to be able to really elevate it to the next level I can just take that and put it in a gift basket like the next day I don't have to worry about um, anything else so I I like that little extra touch that they take. So they do a lot of different color and that is another helpful tip for your displays um, to maybe not put all the greens next to each other. Um, create really truly a rainbow of assortments, your blueberries followed by your tomatoes, your green beans, and then your corn, um, really spread things out. So people are uh, have to stop and take the time to look at every single thing that you have versus it just kind of looking like a wash. Um, so by alternating your different colors, maybe you put things that people tend to buy at the same time together. Um, if people buy a lot of tomatoes and maybe you also offer garlic and cilantro and onions, you know they might be making salsa. So you put those items together for it's easier for them to find. They don't have to spend a lot of time looking at your around your booth. Um, the fruits usually get grouped together too. Uh, different colors help break it up a little bit. Um, putting the cherries between the blueberries and the blackberries helps give it a little assortment of color too. We have several vendors in our area that uh, sell non-produce products like um, these bath soaps. And when I tell you I could smell this picture, I could I can smell this picture. It smelled phenomenal. Um, her display smells great. You can see she has everything grouped by the different uh, floral scents. Uh, she uses these little trays too to put them on, which I thought is a nice, nice touch. Um, you could you know easily find these at the Goodwill or the Salvation Army or things that you could pick up secondhand to really give yourself that extra um, eccentric approach that 
that look that you're going through. So her products spoke for her. Um, they really did. And she's got the nice little uh, signage there too that gives you her prices. Um, and that she has a deal also that encourages people to buy more. Um, $6 per bar or four for 20. Well, I might be inclined to go ahead and buy four. So it smells so good. I want to be able to try multiple different scents. So I'm going to get multiple different scents for the for the lower priced bundle and deal. So that's that's a good marketing strategy as well. And then when you are displaying your products, you want to clearly list your prices, your products, and as what is left. There's always going to be instances where you're going to sell out of something, especially if you're at a high demand part of the market. Shepherdstown Market does a good job of um, not it's, it's a market run by, they don't have an outside market manager, it's run by the vendors themselves. So they do a good job of kind of talking amongst themselves of, okay, I'm going to be the one growing this. We, maybe only like two or three of them um, bring sweet peppers to that market. Uh, maybe a couple others bring hot peppers. Um, so they're not oversaturating with any one thing. So as a result, a lot of the vendors tend to sell out of things, especially things like the salad mix. Um, this producer, they grow, they, they make some granola too um, that helps diversify their sales. They said it's really, really easy for them to do. They do different flavors. They put dried produce in it. Um, like they do apricots and they do peaches and it's super, super, they have gluten-free options, vegan options. They, it's super, super profitable for them. Um, they didn't seem to think that going in. Uh, they have a nice, nice display when they go to the market. And at the bottom, it drives them to their social media, which also helps them be able to um, market different ways too. So speaking a little bit about social media, that is an excellent tool to get people to the market. Um, a social media post can let your customers know where to find you, what you have, and then they know what to expect. If they know I'm going to Sisters Moon Farm today, I got to get some of their great, great granola. Um, a lot of producers will post the day of market. As market's opening, you're sitting there having your morning coffee, you're scrolling a little bit, and you're like, oh, the Shepherdstown Farmer's Market's open um, from nine to one today. I think I might, I can go ahead and I have plenty of time to get there. Some of our other producers might post the day before as you're having your Friday lunch break scrolling um, or in the evening, uh, you can make those plans to go to the market the next day um, and be able to to seek out the products you're looking for. So Middleway Farm here, they post um, the day before, mar they posted like the day before market in the morning. Um, they go to a couple different markets. They they list their different varieties that they're going to have at that day. Um, I prefer to see it the day before personally, because it's hard for me to get my whole family out of the house on a moment's notice. Um, so when it comes to trying to draw people through social media, um, I don't think you can post you could you could do both strategies um, and then you'd get both those types of customers that can just you know leisurely walk out the door and go to the farmer's market and then you could also get those types of customers that have to plan out who's packing the diaper bag the next morning and the stroller and the children and to be able to get to the market to buy the things that they want kind of two different bases of customers our, some of our other producers will post things uh, like their varieties. Um, our orchard, our local orchard here, Twin Ridge, um, they know people are pretty much watering at the mouth, um, waiting for certain varieties to come into season. So they post that. They say, guess what? We have Regina and Emperor Francis are available. Those are the ones we've picked. And you're going to be able to go get those types of cherries. Um, and especially people constantly looking for tart cherries too, they want to be able to, to show that. So don't be afraid to share your varieties and your different production practices if you find that um, that's important to your customers too. People sometimes um, are looking for that information, and if they're not necessarily looking for it, it's a good educational opportunity. Tudor Hall Farm here always shares photos of their farm so you know, you know exactly how it's grown. People love that. So here's, here's some pictures. Um, it's early in the season, so they had things growing in their high tunnel. You can see that they were protecting things from the frost. I mean, it's a working farm. Um, you know where your product's coming from. And those, those details, too, are also um, a lot of time very important to people. I also have producers that I work with that do a great, great job of talking up their own product by sharing how it's cooked. 
Um, this producer is in Berkeley County Red House Farm, uh, and she is constantly sharing photos of them taking their own meat and their own vegetables and doing really, really cool, um, unique recipes with them. Uh, you know, I'm not a big cook. I'm not afraid to sh uh, say that. Uh, so I wouldn't even have thought to make pork meatballs with pickled radishes. Uh, but they, she, and she, in the comments of this photo she shared the recipe too and people just went crazy over it. I mean that just looks so good that's like restaurant quality and just a couple of days ago we had cookouts so this other uh producer was trying to get people to come to their on-farm stand and like who could resist that juicy delicious burger I mean it's lunchtime so uh, my mouth's watering just looking at it you can go get their burger there you can go get the buns there too because they make their own buns um so they shared uh, where they got the burger from. They share where they get the cheese from. Um, they share where you could go and get other uh, produce that maybe they don't have. Oh, are you looking for lettuce? You can go to our neighbors over here and, and get the lettuce that you're looking for and the tomatoes that you're looking for. So they source from other producers and they do a good job of, of advocating for each other and sharing that information on social media too, which might be the most appropriate place for it as well, because you're able to, you know, click on those other links and see where is McDaniel Farm? Where is South Mountain Creamery? And those, um, those, uh, details just give it an extra little special touch to connect to your to your food and I think people really like that other things that can draw people into the market are special events um, I know we might have a couple people on here that help run markets so some markets will do like a kids day where they invite kids to come and share or, or set up a booth at a really low cost or no cost at all and then be there sharing crafts um, this cute little boy is sharing some strawberries from his family's farm um, it encourages people to have a reason to come out maybe that day. Uh, this other event, they were doing a tasting of different tomatoes. Um, so people, they're able to try something new. Uh, I've seen farms do tastings of their different jams and their jellies, uh, just as long as you're following some good food safety protocol, clearing it maybe with your health department. Sometimes you need to do that. I have a food handler's card or something, something low cost like that. Um, you can get people to kind of try before they buy and they'll make that next step to making a purchase. Uh, Charlestown Market has music, they have coffee, um, those types of things is what people get them coming for the experience. Um, and then they might stay and make a purchase. They come back week after week, which is great for your sales. You want people to be able to see you as a destination to purchase uh, kind of their weekly groceries. And you want to get people coming back for more. And these are good ways to, to kind of diversify into, into getting people coming back to your booth week after week. So that is what I have. I hope some of those tips, um, if you're not already practicing them, are things that maybe you can incorporate for the upcoming season. We're still we're still right in the middle of it. Then help everybody uh, boost their sales. Thank you so much, Emily. That was lovely. I love seeing all of the different vendors from different locations and just thinking, yes. I would buy that. I, I am sold on exactly what they're <laughs> trying to plan. I love seeing like the super creative displays that people come up with. I love when they have that little rusticness to it because you just, you know, that farmhouse theme that's super popular because you're like, yeah, you're one of me, you, you know. <laughs> yes. So if anyone has uh, questions or just wants to chime in with examples, I encourage you to do so. You can come off of mute or if you're not as brave, that's okay. You can put things in the chat box as well. Uh, I I had to put in there, Emily, that the, the pepperoni roll, the cinnamon roll photo, one, it was making me hungry just looking at it. But two, we've got a vendor at our local farmer's market and she uses a three-tiered shelf and puts it at the front of her booth and the whole, all of the tiers have pepperoni rolls on them and she organizes them by different variety of pepperoni rolls. So the one has always has jalapeno, the one always has banana pepper, and then the other one always has like original flavor. But she does that every single week, puts it at the very front, and that way it's one of those like things you wanna immediately grab and immediately look for. And for folks like us who have little kids, I know my toddler walks up to that booth every week and grabs one. And then I feel, of course, obligated to go buy it. Or the so cookies. It, and the cookies, yes. Can you yes. buy that for me? 
<laughs> now, granted, you know, he, my my little one loves other things too. Like if there's uh, watermelons, he will go pick up a watermelon at the market and go pick out some strawberries and whatnot. But if you ha if there are kids at your market, do not disregard how much money they can they can really bring in because they pressure parents and parents give right in. Like, <laughs> and I know markets are always like right at either snack time or you're creeping up on lunch. So and maybe that's a st strategy too. People are starting to get hungry as you get out. You know, you maybe you had your morning coffee, but I know people that go to our market um, and they have their coffee. And then there's also sometimes breakfast burritos there too. You can go get your breakfast and, and wander around around market and then do all your shopping and come home to make lunch. Like it's, it's, it's a good strategy. So Sally asked a question. I would like to sell unwashed eggs, but aren't we required to wash and refrigerate eggs? Technically, um, you are not required to wash your eggs. Last I checked, it's in the vendor guard, and I can look it up right now. But last I checked, you are not I required. I think you are still required to get a permit, yeah. the, the farmer's yeah. market permit. Yes. And you are required to label them as ungraded. I'll look it up right now. Because from what I remember, they you are supposed to put them in a cooler, but you did not have to wash them, but you I, did have to label them appropriately. I think it says clean, meaning there can't be any any like feces on them. But I think that means wipe off, not wash. Yes, they have to be free of debris. Let's see what this actually says now. So if you sell up, you can sell up to 150 dozen eggs or less per week of your own production, you must register with the Department of Ag, which I think if it's under, as, as long as you get the small exemption, then I think it's free. It's free, yes, it's you just have a form. To, you have to label the name and address of the person producing the eggs, it has to be on your carton, the date the eggs are packed, and the words ungraded eggs printed in at least 5 8 inch. They shall be clean and free of debris and adhering dirt. So it doesn't have to be washed. And there is an entire egg packet. If you've never sold eggs before and you want that, you can request that from the Department of Ag or one and, of us. And it has a sample to label you. too. Um, yes. And the way to do the dates, the Julian dates, if you're going to date those. And you can use recycled or previously used cartons. You just need to take out the, you need to put your label over the previous label uh, and just make sure that those cartons are clean. They also have to be free of debris and odor. But that saves a ton of money. Like, especially if you do jumbo eggs and you buy those cartons that are 50 cents a piece, tell your customers to bring them back. It creates a really good relationship and it saves you money. And people are usually happy to to recycle those things too because they know that they get use out of them. Oh, okay. Must be held at 45 degrees or less and washed. No, technically I don't think they have to be washed. Was that was that from the health department? It does have a rule about being 45 degrees or less. Department of Ag. Clean and free of debris doesn't technically mean washed. Yes, if they wanted it to be washed, they should say washed. They would, they would write washed, yeah. And that's, washed that's with separate. what? Do green beans need to be kept cool? That's a post-harvest question. Um, that is not a requirement. Kept cool at the market? No. No, the only time that you would be um, limited to having to control those items by time or temperature, meaning with time, they can become unsafe if they're unrefrigerated or if they're not held to a certain temperature, they can become unsafe, would be cut produce. So if you are pre-cutting watermelon slices, for example, and letting people take them as samples, um, 
you would have to discard them after so many minutes um, or probably have to get a permit, um, vendor permit, I think for that. Um, some, uh, we had a producer over here that did zoodles. He did zucchini noodles and then he had to jump through a couple hoops to be able to do that because you're cutting the produce. Cynthia, I'm gonna ask your question just in case anybody wants to chime in. Um, what's a good place to order pre-printed banners, signs with farm names? So one, I think that depends on whether or not you want to use a source online or a place locally. Uh, honestly, I've come across some really competitive prices if you use a local print shop. To, so depending on where you live, um, there's a lot of times like a really nice place that'll do it right in your neighborhood, just because if you outsource it further, then you have to worry about shipping. Um, it might take slightly more time, but not by much. Like the stuff I've come across is really comparable. So if you want to chime in where you live, there might be somebody that wants to give you a recommendation. We probably should mention that if you're talking about um, cut produce, you're getting into a whole nother ball game. Um, with needing hand washing stations and permits and yes. things like that. Um, so in general, that's, that's maybe not a greatest idea unless you're willing to go that whole route with yeah. um, health department requirements and everything. And it's so strange. Many health departments have different requirements. Jefferson County has different requirements than Berkeley County. So it can be, get quite confusing. But that's right, Judy. It often can be a can of worms that we don't recommend opening up if you can avoid it. Catherine gave some some great advice of she gives a free piece of fruit to children, especially in apple seasons, lots of baskets and tears in their display. Um, if they have to weigh things, it slows down the line when they're very, very busy. So they like to pre-weigh um, and pre-select their produce. Um, and she says, don't make the display too pretty. Some people say it's too pretty and afraid to touch it. <laughs> So Cynthia said she's in Greenbrier County. If anyone has a local shop that does pre-printed banners or signs, that might be some a good question for the Farmers Market Association. I don't know if we do banners, Holly, or if there's a recommendation for a print shop in that area. I'd have to look one up. Yeah, I don't know one uh, personally. Uh, we are able to do some signage, but we don't do banners. So Sally chimed in, when we were inspected, the Department of Ag inspector checked the temperature of the cooler. Yes, they'll do that. The eggs shown in this webinar showed the eggs in a carton, not in a cooler, which confused you. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So you are allowed to put, you, you can keep your eggs in a cooler, but you are allowed to keep eggs out on your table for a certain amount of time as well. The goal is to make sure that they stay cool um, but you can put them out for a, a small amount of time. And assuming people are actually coming and buying your eggs pretty frequently, I know some markets, people will come and just buy eggs after eggs after eggs, and it's hard to keep them restocked on top of the table. But if you have that kind of turnover, then you can keep them out without worrying about the fluctuation in temperature. Um, there is actually a rule within your vendor guide so that guy that we put a link to in the chat about how eggs being transported to the market, stored or displayed for sale shall be maintained above freezing at 45 degrees or less ambient temperature provided refrigeration is not required for transportation um, and the transportation is less than three hours. So your goal is to sell those eggs, not have them out on your table for more than three hours um, and then also, if it's really hot outside, don't keep your eggs on the top of the table. But in general, like you could keep a small stack and then and that way people see that you have eggs. Because I know at, at our markets, there's like six vendors that all have eggs, but they sell out so fast. Most people only have so many dozen and that that as a customer, I have to go to every single table and ask if they have eggs or not, if they don't have like a sign that they um that they cross out or a, a, or some sort of signage letting me know whether or not they still have eggs which is just it's just a little bit of a hassle the the main problem that i have is like there's so many people that are also in line in front of me 
trying to like get in and get out with my toddler without buying everything while I'm there. <laughs> like a pepperoni roll. <laughs> like a pepperoni and the cookies. And if the donut lady is not sold out first thing in the morning, oh no, that <laughs> that is where we're going first, per, like every time. <laughs> yeah, when we talk about things that are time temperature controlled it means if they are left out for so that usually is what potentially hazardous foods all sometimes in food safety we call them time temperature controlled so if they are left out for a certain amount of time at an improper temperature they could make people sick so things like i mean this quote accounts when you go to a, you know a buffet the golden crowd to go on a buffet how how often they're allowed to leave food out and how hot it has to be or how how long it has to be before it's refrigerated um so meat's a different thing too uh you can't let your meat to thaw it has a different like temperature it needs to be held at to keep it frozen it has a different time it's allowed to be removed um or not held at that temperature before it's still safe If anyone has any additional comments or questions, feel free to go ahead and ask or toss them in the chat. We have just a couple of minutes left before we officially wrap up. But thank you all for providing really good examples and asking questions. And also thank you for Emily for giving the presentation today and talking, giving lots of really good examples. No problem. <laughs>